Danny. I was in a long-term abusive relationship. My name is Vanessa Serratos. I was in a long-term abusive relationship. My name is Ambrosia Martinez, and I was sexually assaulted. And this is Uncovered. Hi, my name is Vanessa Serratos. I am 18 years old, and I was in a long-term abusive relationship. Um, this started back about last year. My ex and I had known each other since we were in third grade, like first crush, first best friend, everything. Um, you know, even after I moved across town, we still stayed close. Fast forward to about middle school, you know, he had been in different relationships as well as I have. We were always still kind of there for each other for certain things. And we were open to maybe giving it a try, being in a relationship. But he had let me know that he was going to juvie for being in an altercation with someone and beating them so bad to the point where they were in the hospital. Uh, the other man's parents was pressing charges. So we lost contact. And then up until about three and a half years ago, I saw him on a friend's Instagram where he got tagged. And, you know, I reached out to him like, hey, have you been? It's been a while. And it just clicked. Like, nothing, nothing changed. You know, the feelings were still there. And we started hanging out. But it was different. Like, he had become, like, this player type to the point where, like, we'd be hanging out and he'd be texting other girls. Uh, it would come up to like, oh, my baby, another girl, my queen, another one, like, she, she'll be mine soon, would pop up. And, you know, I would just push it aside because, you know, we weren't dating, so I felt like I didn't have any right to say anything. And then, um, you know, to the point where he would leave hickeys on me and tell me not to say who it was from. Be like, oh, are you leaving soon because my, my friend Emily's coming over, stuff like that. Um, eventually I got tired of it. And I left, and then he hit me up about two weeks after I had left and saying, oh, you know, I was wrong, I was dumb, it, it should have been you, you know, my whole family loves you, this, this, and that. And, you know, it took a while for me to forgive him, but we started dating. We were together for uh, about a year until we broke up. And the whole time, you know, even in the beginning, it was mostly mental like abuse where he would tell me like oh you can't hang out with this person cut off all my guy friends you know go through my phone even if he had no reason to go through my phone even I if I would like a girl like he I wouldn't I wouldn't be allowed to talk to certain girls that he didn't like so if I liked their tweets if I you know would message him saying hey girl I miss you or hey dude let's hang out he would break my phone he broke at least four of my phones and I always told my parents that I dropped it or something and they're not stupid they knew um it gets to the point where he told me, like, oh, I don't want you wearing makeup at school or certain outfits, you know, so send me what you're wearing at school today because we went to different schools at the time. And, you know, and when we first started dating, I, I knew that he had, you know, uh, ment mental illnesses. He suffered from depression, bad anger management, and his family didn't care. They thought he was just looking for attention, even though, he, you know, he attempted suicide. You know, he always would cut himself. And so I, I thought, you know, oh... He's just, you know, he's insecure, you know, and I'm all he has. So this is why he's so controlling of me, and I made excuses for it. Um, there would also be times where if he, like, he would just show up just to make sure that I wasn't doing anything. And again, like, I, I never cheat on him, nothing, anything like that. And then it got to the point where he started hanging out with friends who were smoking, doing drugs, and he would go to parties and stuff like that, and I would not be okay with that, the lying and doing stuff behind my back, but he would do it anyways. Um, go to parties, send me pictures of him with other girls. That's not cheating, I guess, because he didn't do anything with them. He just took pictures with them. And then, you know, to the point where I would call him, you know, and his friends would be in the back saying, hey, like, hang up on her, she's stupid. Come have fun with us. And he would hang up on me and let them disrespect me and then probably say other things about me. And then um, to the point where I was getting so tired of it, I, would want, I wanted to leave. So he started calling me very, very derogative, like, names, you know, telling me things like, oh, I, you know what, I hope you die, like, you deserved all the things that happened to you when you were little, all the stuff that your family did to you, you know, I hope you kill yourself, um, and to the point where, like, I almost wanted to, because this was the year that I was very suicidal, going through a lot with my family, my family didn't care, I felt like he was all I had, and he was 
telling me stuff like that, you know, and I had been um, cutting myself, so he would be like, I hope you continue to do that, you know, like, go ahead and keep doing it because you're ugly, like, all the scars on your body will never go away, and you deserve them. And, you know, like, I would always make excuses for him, like, oh, he was mad, I pushed him to this point. I would always go to my friends at first, but, you know, after, or, like, it's repeating, he keeps doing it, he keeps doing it, he keeps saying this, my friends got tired of it, but, like, now, like, it's basically, you're asking for it at this point if you don't leave. So I stopped telling people that he would say that. There came to a fight where we were arguing so bad in my mom's car that he, he tried to leave and I wouldn't let him leave. And so he pushed me back and I went after him and he slammed my mom's cor uh, car door on my head and like it broke on my head. And like I was like bleeding and he freaked out. And I don't think he freaked out because he hurt me. I think he didn't want to get in trouble. Because that's what he kept saying like, are you going to tell someone? Like this is not, and I never did. I told my mom that someone broke into her car. So I continued to, you know, defend him and stuff like that. Like I, I would think, oh, like. God is putting us through this because he's testing our relationship to see if we can make it through it. He's going to change, this and that. And then this kept going. It never changed. And then after a trip that I had to Florida, he had a party at his house with a lot of girls there. And I came back and I was just done. I didn't want to do this anymore. And he could tell that I was pulling apart, so he broke up with me first. And so I was just hanging out with my friends, doing all the things that I couldn't do when I was with him. And he thought that I was sleeping around. So he's he calls me over and we hang out and I think maybe we'll fix things and get back together. And instead, like as soon as I come through the door, he like pushes me and then grabs me by my neck and then by my hair and then just spits in my face. And like says, like, how could you do this to me? Like, do you see what you're making me do? Um, he would rip my clothes, like, everything that I was wearing until I was, like, like, all my clothes were ripped. And he would spit in my face and call me, you know, a bunch of names, uh, accuse me of cheating on him, and, like, ask me over and over, like, what did you do behind my back? What did you do? And I, would, I was just crying, and I'd be like, please let me go. Like, I'll never talk to you again. Like, I'll leave you alone. Like, please just leave me alone. And like he's like, all right, fine, then go. And then as soon as I tried to run through the door, he grabbed me by my hair and pulled me, like, threw me back, grabbed my phone and completely smashed it. And then um, he punched me a couple times in my face, slapped me, and then um, he, like, his friends came over. So he threw me in the backyard and told me to be quiet. His friends saw me as they were walking towards his bedroom, but they stayed quiet because I was bleeding. And I, like, my eye was swollen, but they stayed quiet. And they went to his room and they didn't say anything. And then after 30 minutes, an hour, he came out. was like, I'm sorry, you know, but look what you made me do. Look how mad you got me. This would never happen, da, da, da. You know, and then I, he, he's like, I'll call you a taxi. You can go home and we can talk about this tomorrow. And just, I'm so sorry. I never thought that I would do that to you. And, you know, I kind of always saw it coming. Because when we would fight, he would always back me into corners and clench his fist. Or punch a wall next to me. You know, it's like he would, like... Prevent, trying to prevent himself from hitting me, even though he really wanted to. Uh, in public, he would he, if we were fighting in public, he would grab my wrist or like the back of my neck and take me somewhere private so we could fight. And so yeah, and then after that, um, we didn't talk for a couple days. And in my head, I was just like, like why? Like shouldn't you be sorry for what you just did to me? Like shouldn't you be trying to make amends or something? Like anything like that? And like. Um, my brothers had picked me up from his house, so they were so mad, but they were more focused on me being okay. So my, for the next couple of days, my brother stayed with me to make sure that I was okay, you know. I would wake up in the middle of the night and just start crying, you know, because it was so scary. Because I never, like, thought that you, like, could see what evil really looked like, looked like until I looked him in the eyes as he was choking me. And it was, it was scary. And then, um, fast forward, like, um, he called me asked me if I was going to press charges. I, I said no. And I was like, what are you doing? Like, shouldn't you be sorry? And he tried to show me like, how sorry he was. He knew he would never do it again. And we continued to talk. And that's where I messed up. And, you know, he, he, he was always saying sweet things, trying to be sorry. And then, like, one day we hung out. Um, and it was okay again until he went through my phone. And he's like, oh, who's your, you're talking to your brothers again, you know? 
you your family, like your cousin and them, you're like you have contact with them again. Yeah. And he he didn't let me explain and he immediately like threw my phone and grabbed me by my arm, threw me down and started choking me again. And the bruise on my arm was so big it literally looks like a hand. And that was something I couldn't hide. So I, I wore sweaters and stuff like that and turtlenecks, you know. And then he left and like it kind of made me feel like it was my fault. You know, the way that he, the manipulation that he pulled, like, you made me do this, you lied to me, this, this, and that. So he left and we broke up again. And then after that, I was just kind of done. And like, I blocked him on everything. I was drinking all the time going out to parties, doing things that I would never do. I started smoking, which I was completely against, just for me. And then, um, you know, eventually I called him when I was drunk and I was just like, how could you do this to me? You know, I like, I loved you. And then um, he came over and we talked and we got back together. And then, you know, things for me, like thankfully I woke up one day and I just didn't love him anymore. And like, I don't know what happened, like, I don't know how it is possible for me to lose all that in one night, but I woke up and I was just like, I don't want to be in this anymore. Like, what am I doing? I'm lying to all my friends, like my family. Like, I know what he's doing isn't okay. And so I left, like, for the first time in our entire relationship. And then for to him, it was, he thought I was going to come back. He thought that um, I was just messing around. And then once he saw that I was just, genuinely happy like going to church um connecting with all my friends again it wasn't okay to him so after a month after that he came to my mom's house and he knew that my mom would go out every other night once he saw that her car wasn't there he knew that i was alone we were been broken up and he heard that i had been uh talking to other people moving on flirting doing this and that so he came over and like the first thing here was like beer bottles being thrown at my house and then him yelling so he, like, I opened the screen door, but, and I, I told him, like, what are you doing? Like, get out of here, I'm gonna call the cops. And he's like, no, I'm just drunk, I was with my friends downtown, I just, like, let me in so I can call a taxi. And that was my mistake, so I let him in. And I was still so scared of him, like, I, I stayed in a corner, I was like, you stay away from me, call the taxi, and then leave. And, like, he put the phone down, and he started looking at me, you know, and then he immediately just attacked me. And like that whole, the whole night, like I have, I was able to get my phone to record some of it. Um, he messed up my whole like house looking, he's like, I'm going to take money. I'm going to take whatever I want and I'm never going to see you again. Like, this is what you get. Like, I honestly wish that I could do worse to you. Like you deserve so much more, but like I called the cops. So he left, um, the, co the cops came and I filed a police report, but I never went through with it because he would always tell me like, oh, what's gonna happen to me? How am I gonna get a job? How, like, what's, what's my family gonna think? And like, I, ju I just never went through with it. And then even, this was just last year and even till now, he still calls me, you know, leaving threatening messages. I have a restraining order against him right now. And um, he d still to this day hasn't fully left me alone. Like if he sees me at a public event, he, always comes up to me. There was a guy that I was with and he attacked me and him in front of everyone. It's like he's not ashamed of it at this point. But, you know, I got out of it. I don't know how. I don't know, like I'm, I'm more thankful than anything that I literally just woke up and was like, I don't want this anymore. And like I just stopped loving him like it was nothing. Um, and as soon as I let go of that abuse that like the ties that he had of me, like it was, I've never been happier in my life. Like, I, was, I hung out with all my friends again. I, I got to do things that I never got to do when I was with him. I connected with some people in my family. Um, and I got to, like, I got to concentrate on school. I stopped drinking and it was just one of the best things. And I actually like, my confidence grew and my self-esteem got better and I, I became more happy and I realized that I didn't need anyone. I, I didn't want to be in a relationship ever again after that. Um, I completely lost my outlook on love. Um, I did go to therapy because, you know, when my friends would raise their hands at me for like a high five or anything, I would cringe. You know, 
he had a gun, so whenever I would threaten to leave, he would shoot around the room. So whenever I heard bottles clean, loud noises like that, I would, I would immediately get really scared, you know, and I never told people. I would just be like, oh, like, I, I'm just scared easily. Um, and then, like, after, you know, months of therapy and, like, just me being by myself, I just, I look back and I don't understand why I stayed for so long. I think it was the fact that I wanted to say that he was my best friend since third grade and my first love, and I want, like, it would be, like, a fairy tale ending. We would get married and this and that, but, like, now it sucks because I see my first love as, you know, the guy who abused me, and I loved him, but he didn't. He hurt me. He destroyed me in like every way possible. And but I mean, like you can get out, and it, it's it's impo It seems so impossible to let go. Like you feel like you can't live without that person. You feel like you can make them better. They make you better. That you won't ever be able to be with anyone else after this. But it, it's not true. It's the fact that they have that control over you. That manipulation and like all the things that they have on you and it makes you feel like you're obligated to stay you know like they don't have they threaten to kill themselves and stuff like that it makes you feel obligated to stay and it's not how it should be and like even now if i didn't leave i don't think i would be the person that i am today you know setting like i have nieces and nephews who look up to me and even finally now i'm actually in a healthy relationship to where I don't have, you know, those ties on me. No one's looking through my phone. No one's preventing me from doing what I want. Like, the respect and trust there is mutual. And that's how it should have been. But in my eyes, I thought that what we had was love with my ex, and it wasn't. I made excuses for the abuse, and I made excuses for what I did staying with him, and it, it should have never been like that. My name is Danny, I'm 27, and I was in a long-term abusive relationship. I moved to Los Angeles by myself, working in the film industry. Um, when I first got there, I lived by myself, and it was pretty rough. Um, a couple months after I moved to LA, um, I met the man that is now my ex. Um, we only had dated about three months. He was always a really nice, very compassionate person. He seemed like a really good, genuine person. So we moved in with each other pretty quickly, um, which is not very normal for me. Um, and within about a couple months after we had moved in together, I started noticing weird changes in him. Um, he would make strange comments, like if we went out to dinner, he would ask me if I was actually gonna finish eating all that. He would remind me that I work in entertainment and that I needed to maybe like start monitoring my food income and uh, eventually I got down to eating less than 200 calories a day and he, uh, we would go to restaurants he would say things like to the waiter if I ordered food like if I ordered pasta he would say no she's only allowed to eat salad and he would then change my order and the people in the like restaurants and stuff would always do it which is like to me now looking back always seemed really strange but he would pretend like it was about my well-being and when I would tell my friends or people would see him acting like that um, they would say like hey you know this is this is a red flag you need to maybe consider getting out of a relationship and he didn't stop there he started monitoring all of my financial transactions um, like I said, I work in television, so I'm a contractor, so I would actually, at one point, he would require that I gave him all of my paychecks, and he would basically control allowances, purchases, everything like that. Um, he stopped having sex with me because he told me I was fat and disgusting, which was one of his control tactics. And after about, I would say, two and a half years of that, 
I told him that I wasn't comfortable with it anymore, and I found a little bit of um, courage to kind of to stand up to him, and that's when he started getting violent, and um, he would throw things, he would throw things at me, he would um, hit me with stuff. Uh, I'm I'm pretty small, so he would uh, physically pick me up and throw me against the wall. Um, over the course of our relationship, I had seven concussions that, seven concussions that had prevented me from working. So I became very financially dependent on him, and I felt like I couldn't leave. And it wasn't, <coughs> excuse me, it wasn't until the last concussion that I got where, um, it was so bad that I actually have permanent brain damage from it now. Um, I have seizures now caused from the damage. I have to take medication. Um, my life has completely changed because of it. And it was that last concussion where he almost killed me. Um, and uh, he actually attacked me while I was asleep out of nowhere, I was just asleep, and he just came and started beating me. And um, I didn't know what to do, and I wasn't thinking very clearly. And the first thing I did was, um, I grabbed a shotgun and, and I pulled it out, and I said, if you don't leave, I'm gonna kill you. And he left. I called the cops, they didn't do anything. Um, when I went to the hospital, I was told that I couldn't sleep for several days because it would kill me. And so now I'm just kind of, you know, rebuilding my life. Um, and it took me a long time to feel comfortable with a lot of stuff again. Um, I didn't work for about eight months. Um, I was homeless at one point because I was forced to be financially dependent on him. And I was terrified, and I felt like I couldn't talk to anybody about it. Um, because he had told me so much that it was my fault, I really believed it. And then finally, one of my other girlfriends had come out to me about a similar situation that she was in, where her, her husband, they were married, was basically doing the same thing to her, and she was scared, and she said, I don't know who else to talk to. And her and I got together and started talking about this, and we realized how frequent it is and how many women are put into these situations that they feel like they've lost all control of their life. They don't have a way out, and they're put into these situations by men or whoever their abuser is, and they can't leave. And once I realized that I wasn't the only person, going through this, and that there was so many women out there suffering through the same thing every day, just on the outside, it was every day, you just had to be perfect and make it look good, and you know, and every time you would go home, it was a war zone, and it wasn't just me, it's, there's a lot of people that live their life like that. And so now I'm trying to like promote women to come out and just let other people know it's not just you, and it's not your fault, it's a bad situation that you are put in by somebody who has no control over you. Don't let them control you because, like what happened with me, as soon as you give them that control, it breaks you. And you don't have to feel like that. You don't, you're not alone. You don't have to feel like that. Tell people. I know it's scary, and telling people is the hardest thing. I justified his actions to my own friends for years. I, you know, I told them, like, no, you know, he just says that because he, he's worried about, you know, me spending too much money, or he's worried about me, you know, gaining too much weight, or he's worried about my health, when realistically he was just trying to mess with me and control me and, and put me into a place where I felt like I couldn't leave. And once you can talk to people about it and share those experiences, you'll realize that there's a lot of people out there who understand or maybe they've experienced it or they've seen it in their friends and the only way that we can really stop this is to continue to talk about it and to share our experiences with each other because that's the only way we're ever going to stop this.
Martinez. I'm 18 years old and I was sexually assaulted when I was 14. One night I decided to go out to a party with my friends and she was a bit older than me and she was my bestest friend in the whole world. I trusted her. I gave a lot of money to her. My family took her and we took her on family vacations and um, just one of those people that you could always go and talk to. She was a very, very important person in my life. Um, I was a freshman at the time, so I was 14. She was a junior in high school. And summer comes along, you know, everyone's doing their own thing. You know, I'm, she's going to be a senior and I'm going to be a sophomore. And, you know, everything's, everything's going good. And she used to confide in me into a lot of things about how, like, she felt that people didn't want her, like no one liked her and stuff, so I like decided like, you know, you're going to be my best friend forever. And um, on July 4th, she made the decision of taking me and drugging me to her ex-boyfriend's house. Um, I was not fully aware of this. I thought we were just going to go over there and drink and have fun, and I had one sip of al an alcohol that my own best friend gave me and next thing I know I black out. I wake up the next day with bruises. I'm in a bed with two people. I have no idea who they are except for my best friend and she just looks at me and she laughs. And I asked her like, you know, what, what happened? She was like, nothing that you weren't prepared for. So I was like, okay. And then she made me go home and she told me to take 15 of my planned birth controls just so I didn't get pregnant. I wasn't aware that I even had sex that night. Um, like I said, I don't remember anything. A couple weeks go by, a couple days go by, and I start remembering what had happened. I started remembering the drinks. I started remembering trying to go to sleep in a private room because I was really tired. I remembered hallucinating. And the last thing that I did remember was her like screaming for help to me, for me to go in the room and then the guy locking the door in the back. She ended up telling the guy that I was 18 when I was 14 at the time. All because this guy didn't want to date her. So she brought me along into a situation where it's, to make, to get what she wanted, I had to be a victim in that. My memory started to jog back to me after about a week or so and I noticed that her behavior was really different. She was really nice to me. Kind of like she knew like she did a bad thing. And I kept wondering like why why do I feel sick? Why do like why don't I feel like myself until I started having, you know, I started remembering what happened and I just remembered that they both lured me into the room and the door was locked. And next thing I know I'm getting slapped around, I'm getting hit and that was, that's all I recall from drinking that night. And when I asked her about it, she was like, well, she apologized and she cried. And she was like, well, he didn't want me. So I thought maybe if I brought you along, he'd want you to. So this, I was just, I guess, in, I, I'm not even going to say in the wrong place at the wrong time. I was literally in a horrible place and I couldn't get out of it. I was 14, I didn't drive. She even had the willpower to text my parents and tell them that I was okay while I was, you know, passed out. Um, the cops never did anything. They never got investigated. I got tested, my rape kit came back positive, and, but there was no DNA to show it because I did wait three weeks to tell someone. I didn't sleep for three weeks, I didn't eat. I was 90 pounds. I started having really bad depression, bad anxiety attacks, and then I went to the doctor and they t they did um, a like a brain scan on me and my brain is like the size of like a Vietnam war veteran. That's how bad my thoughts have gotten. Um, after that, she admitted it and then lied to everyone, never talked to me again. Um, she went on about her life. She never cared. She never apologized. The guy was never caught. He was never troublesome. I've seen him out in town a few times, and he kind of just laughs at me when I've seen him. When I had seen him a couple years ago, and 
they they were just very careless people so it was the hardest thing for me to do and I still I've struggled with it for four years I'm 18 now and this happened when I was 14 and the first year was the hardest year I will ever encounter um, I didn't go to school for about a month I was very suicidal. I was on a lot of um, antidepressants. I they the doctors ended up they were like I don't know what we can do. There's there's not much to do for a long time. My own parents couldn't hug me. I couldn't go to school and be touched without thinking that like so, like that's uncomfortable to me. No one was allowed to touch me. Not even my parents weren't allowed. No one was allowed in my room. I didn't get dressed in front of anyone when I went to gym. I didn't. When I told the teachers that I wanted to sit in the back, I meant I wanted to sit in the back by myself. I isolated myself for the whole year. And my anxiety, my social anxiety got so bad, I decided to be homeschooled. Because I couldn't take people coming up to me. I couldn't take guys glaring at me. I couldn't take, couldn't stand older men looking at me. I couldn't stand women looking at me. And then I fell into a deeper, deeper spot. And I started doing a lot of drugs. I started doing, like, drinking a lot. And that was never, that didn't help whatsoever. I'd like wake up on like the bottom of my floor and one of my best friends actually told me that like I got really drunk one night and she said that I was just holding myself in the corner of my room. Like asking why what happened to me happened. It's been four years and I have not yet still fully recovered. The people I have dated, you know, intimately and personally, I have never trusted them fully. Even if I do tell them, hey, this happened to me, one day I may freak out on you. No one has been able to handle that. No one has ever said anything remotely to make me even more comfortable. I'll be at work and some guy, sometimes a guy will touch me and I'll start freaking out. Like I said, it's been four years, and I haven't, um, there's a lot of things I do struggle with. The doctors diagnosed me with, gosh, I don't even know what's the deepest word for depression, like, such a deep depression that, like, I wouldn't get out of bed. They were like, you're not lazy, but you, you don't have that mindset like everyone else to do anything. I have extremely bad PTSD, meaning someone touches me, I will freak out. Like, it, re it reminds me of, like, seeing my two rapist's face. And that's exactly what I see sometimes when I'm not in that mood. I was suicidal. I still sort of am suicidal because I just, it's been four years and my mindset has not gone back to where it's going to be. And I don't know, and it probably never will. And it's been really hard. And there have been a lot of times where I've just wanted to give up. There's nothing I can do about it. I can't change myself. I can't changed the way it affected me and it it ruined everything I had it took away every confidence every strip of giving myself to someone else I felt like I can't but to everyone out there you are not alone to every girl that's hasn't told anyone hasn't told their parents haven't told their friend you are not alone I thought I was alone for so long to the point where I tried taking my own life. And this is a video that I hope gets to all of those girls out there. I'm still here and I'm still trying. And I really hope all of you guys do too. And I hope you guys know that you did not get anything taken away from you. I don't ever want you, I don't, I don't myself ever want to feel like that, and I don't want you guys to ever feel like that. You have to say something, otherwise it's going to eat you inside. And it did, it ate me alive for so long, it still does. It needs to stop. I'm tired. 
of thinking that my life isn't worth it anymore. I am tired of not being able to love someone anymore. I am tired of looking in the mirror and being so disgusted with who I am. It needs to stop, but I really hope every single one of you young ladies that is watching this that can relate to this says something because there are people there to help you and there are people who relate to every single pain and feeling you're going through. not just something you know to raise money or anything like we are here to talk to each and any one of them you know to raise so, awareness yep. <clears throat> and you're honestly you're really strong mm -hmm.